This is Duke University. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We have over about 180 strong, which is a terrific turnout um, tonight. And so thank you, thank you so much. My name is Sterling Wilder, and I'm a member of the class of 1983 and the director of alumni affairs. And we are um, really thrilled to be here in Dallas. Um, I want to thank the uh, Duke Club of North Texas and our many volunteers who have helped us this evening and, and help pull, pull this event off and together. Um, and again, we are particularly thrilled to be in Dallas, and Bob Penn says he's been trying to get us here for years, and so here we are. Thank you, Bob. Um, we're also particularly delighted to be here at the Nasher Sculpture Garden. As you all know, Ray Nasher is a bullet was a beloved alum and trustee of Duke, and of course a terrific benefactor, and so it's very special that our event is here this evening. And of course, we have some special guests here, President Richard Broadhead and Dr. Sandy Williams. And Sandy is the Senior Vice Chancellor of Duke Medicine and the University's Senior Advisor for International Strategy. And many of you know, because you're here tonight because of them, that Sandy and Jennifer Williams were here in Dallas for many years. And we're delighted, it's particularly special to have them here tonight, but we're particularly excited that they call Durham and Duke home. So that's really good for us. <laughs> Also this evening here is Cindy Broadhead, who are here with President Broadhead, and also Bob Shepard. Bob, did he go back up? Oh, is he waving? Right there. I was the Vice President for Alumni Affairs and Development and my boss, which is why I introduced him quickly. And, and first, and then uh, Richard Riddell, who's the uh, Vice President University Secretary, is also here with us, standing in the back as well. So because you're good inquisitive dookies, you're probably asking, what is the Duke idea? Now you may not have asked that, but I'm going to pretend that you're all wondering what that is. Uh, the Duke idea is a little bit of a, of a different spin on a traditional alumni event, and the purpose of, of the event is to bring you the intellectual excitement of Duke directly to you, our alumni and parents. And we want you to be able to hear firsthand from deans and faculty members and senior administrators about the new and innovative programs they are working on and their numerous successes. Um, we had our first Duke Idea event in Boston last November, and you were number two, so that's also very special. And then in a few weeks, we're going to Fort Lauderdale, and then we'll go to New York City, we'll go to San Francisco, Seattle, Nashville, Chicago, and London, all before the end of June. And we have different um, administrators that will, that will be with us. In, in November, in Boston, we had Dean Blair Shepard um, from the Fuqua School of Business. Which was also real, which is really fun and great success. This is why we know tonight is going to be so good. So, what does happen tonight? First, you will hear a, a few words from President Broadhead about Duke and what's happening on campus, and then you'll have a, hear a conversation between President Broadhead and Dr. Williams on the state of modern medicine and how Duke is adapting to meet the healthcare demands of the 21st century. From their conversation, we hope you will gain insight into the challenges of providing quality healthcare and educating the generation of practitioners who will deliver it. I expect you'll have some comments and questions for our speakers, and we've asked that you'll wait till the end um, to do that, and we will have mics, so we'll be able to hear your questions. Uh, we also, as I promised those of you that I told to come down, the reception, full dinner, and dessert, the chocolate, someone asked for chocolate, will continue um, afterwards, and we hope that you'll stay and continue to enjoy being with your fellow Dukies. And also, it sounds crazy, but any Blackberry or phone that is on will interfere with the lavalier mics. And we found that out in Orange County, California, in a conversation with President Broadhead and um, Duke alum Bill Gross. And it, it, it makes quite a sound. And we're taping and audioing this so we can put it on the um, web for everyone to see. So we don't want to hear those sounds. Trust me, you really don't. So before I turn the program over, I always have to put in a plug about the Alumni Association. Um, we have just over 2,000 alums and parents in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and your involvement and commitment to Duke are so important. And how do you engage? I know a couple of you said they haven't been back to campus in 10 or 15 or 20 years, but you're still volunteering for Duke. You came to this event. You read the Duke magazine. You may give to the annual fund. You interview students. You go, go to club events. You work on your reunions. You uh, and any kind of way, you watch a basketball game with friends, any ways that you can get engaged with Duke is terrific and it's important. And our job at the Alumni Association, 
That was filmed too. Our job at the Alumni Association is to make sure that you sustain your engagement and that we also provide different ways for you to engage. Not everyone wants to go to a game watching, not everyone wants to go to a lecture, but there are all a whole different ways that, that we can do this and we want to do a better job of that. And also some people are undergraduate alums or your graduate professional alums. Some of you are younger. The younger staff in my office refer to me and my um, age group as more mature alums. <laughs> so, um, also have programming just for us, though, so that's all people like that. So, but also, when you're having this engagement, we want to make sure that you're enjoying it and it's meaningful, because then you'll stay connected with Duke and with Duke people, and that's really what it's all about. And that's what our role is at the Alumni Association, is to connect you to Duke and to Duke people. So let us know whatever ideas that you may have. We can't do Carolina tickets, but other than that, <laughs> we're there to help you. So that's all over, and now we're going to turn it over to our program. And my first job is to, or my own last job, is to introduce President Richard Broadhead. And since becoming Duke's ninth president in 2004, President Broadhead has ushered in a new era of expansion, investment, and altruism at Duke. From the creation of the Duke Global Health Institute and the success of our financial aid initiative to the launch of our civic service program, Duke Engage, President Broadhead has been a true leader for our university, and it's my pleasure to turn over the program and the podium to Dick Broadhead. Thank you. Thing, which is this uh, podium is equipped with a little water bomb I can set off at some point. Uh, and I'm sure Sterling will be taking special interest in that. Let me say, uh, when I go somewhere, it's a pleasure to gather a group of loyalists of Duke, uh, but to gather a group this size is just so uh, uh, great. Uh, and if there are some mature alumni here, that's great. If there are some immature alumni here, that's great. Uh, you're all most welcome. Uh, and it'll be, we'll have a little program, and then it will be fun to hang out as well. Uh, I've been to uh, Dallas on Duke behalf more than once, uh, uh, but, uh, but this is a me particularly memorable for me. And I just would begin by saying, as I think we all do, uh, how especially meaningful it is to come not just to this fabulous museum, but to a museum that was built by one of our alums. Uh, and when this was a brand new museum, I was a brand new president of Duke. And I came to, uh, to Duke and raised an uh, invitation, and he and Nancy and David took Cindy and me, and Ray told us everything. Did we see the roof? Did we see the light came coming? Did we see the, light, the way the light came in? Did we have any idea what it was like to move those trees into the garden and so on? Uh, if you knew Ray Nasher, you knew a shrewd and canny and brilliant and generous person. Uh, and for me, when I stop and think of that guy, and I just want to at the beginning here, uh, you know, Ray is a great example of education. He's somebody, his parents took him to museums when he was little, and he saw things, and he noticed them, and it was the beginning of a great education. You know he was the captain of the tennis team at Duke in 1942. Uh, then he went on and became a great real estate developer, a great uh, builder of this city. Uh, but then he's somebody whose education planted a taste for beautiful things in his mind. And he built what I think is regarded as uh, the greatest collection of uh, sculpture, perhaps in the world, and certainly in private hands. And then he did something else that we can all be reminded to do. He not only used his intelligence to expand his personal pleasure, he then used that to expand the possibility of public pleasure by creating this museum in this city and just so magnificent. Just you walk out in that garden out back and you think, somebody dreamed this up and like there were bulldozers here and then they went away and then this was here. It's just so wonderful. And I would say, when I come to your, uh, your uh, National Sculpture Museum, I would be very envious, but I'm not, because I've got one of my own. <laughs> <laughs> because Ray is, I do believe, the only person in the history of the world to have built two museums almost simultaneously, uh, uh, the Nasher at Duke that has made such a difference to us all. Uh, so Ray, here's to you. Just to say, the format, as uh, Sterling explained, I'm going to babble on for a few minutes, uh, and then I'm going to invite a friend and colleague up here, uh, and, uh, who just is a typical 
a standard issue Duke person. Uh, just like, incredibly interesting and has done very important things. Uh, uh, and uh, he and I will chat, by which I mean I'll ask him questions that any of you would ask him, and so I'll just make it more efficient by asking a few of them. Then after we have him all re uh, revved up, uh, then uh, all, any of you can ask either of us some questions. But first, let me just uh, begin the what we might call the Lake Wobegon portion of the program. <laughs> and just say a little bit about uh, where Duke is now. Uh, certainly the year 2008-2009 will always be remembered as a year of unprecedented turbulence in the economic world around us. Uh, but I think anyone who has been on campus this fall would also tell you it has been a particularly wonderful year on campus, a year of high spirits, of uh, one thing after another, of all different sorts. So our, our year began this year, uh, the day after school started, we uh, inaugurated the exhibit at the Nasher of the uh, works of the exhibit called From El Greco to Velazquez, uh, when Time Magazine uh, rated the 10 best uh, art exhibits of last year. Uh, this was ranked number three. It showed two places in the world. One was in Boston and one was in Durham. So that was fun. Uh, right after, you know, but this year, actually, you know, four years ago, you couldn't have gone to see El Greco uh, at Dora because there was no place anybody would have left, dreamed of lending an El Greco to. Uh, uh, but with our new museum, we have new, uh, uh, new, uh, new forms of entertainment and education. Uh, this year you could go from there to a football game. Uh, well, all colleges have football games, you might say, uh, but this year we actually had winning games. <laughs> winning games, yes. Indeed, I actually ran into the spectacle while walking from my house to Wallace Wade uh, Stadium of scalpers. <laughs> And although we aren't entirely there yet, we are at a way different place than we were a year ago. Uh, and that was fun. You know, to have 30,000 people in this place that used to sometimes have 30,000 opponents, uh, fans, and none of our own. Uh, this is better. It was just really good. And everybody loves basketball. But you know, there's parts of the year when basketball isn't played. So we have uh, to be glad for that. Uh, I, it was a, uh, for me, a very meaningful moment this year. I think it was in late October when we got the contribution that put us over the $300 million mark in our campaign to raise endowment funds for financial aid. Now, having a museum is important. Having a great football team is important. But there are things that are yet more important than either of those. And one is making sure that the great opportunities that, you, that the world's great universities provide are open to people, dependent on their ability and their drive, and irrespective of their parents' income. So that was a great day of the fall as, of the fall as well. Uh, it seemed to me this fall, almost every day, there was some super smart person coming to campus to talk in some uh, especially revealing way about something. When Tom Friedman's new book came out uh, at, the end, at the very end of the summer about uh, modern energy and uh, its economic consequences, uh, one of the first places he went to to speak after that book was published was at Dewey. He met all day long with groups of students, small groups of students. Even that person, described by his own wife as indefatigable, was finally wiped out at the end of the day uh, because we squeezed him so dry. Uh, but I'll tell you, it was memorable. Uh, and then our law school has a spacious new addition, a kind of a new library, a new commons, uh, and to dedicate it, uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy came, uh, and standing in front of the new windows that tie that place to campus in a whole new way, he gave one of the most profound meditations on the nature of law and the meaning of the rule of law that I have ever heard. You probably know the name of Michelle Ree, the 37-year-old woman who is in charge of the public school system in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, where 20% of the students are uh, attain at grade level and 80% do not. Uh, she came, again, she met all day long with student groups. She met with the Durham uh, 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 School Board. She gave a great talk at the end of the day. She came to a dinner. You know, we know that K-12 education is as urgent an issue as this country has, and so our campus was a place uh, where somebody could come and talk in an enlightening and provocative way about that. 
I went to an event at the law school uh, where <coughs> people who ran large private equity uh, firms uh, came and talked about what that's like these days uh, <laughs> on the same uh, platform with our new trustee, Gao Xixing, uh, the graduate of the law school, one of the first people from China to take a law degree in the US who is now in charge of investing the sovereign wealth funds of China. Uh, that was interesting to us all. Uh, last was today, Thursday. Uh, on Sunday, uh, we had Reverend Joseph Lowry, who co-founded uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference with Martin Luther King, came and gave a completely memorable talk uh, that he finally had to end to catch the plane to go to Washington because he delivered the benediction at the inaugural on Tuesday. <laughs> Uh, so I just want to say, never a dull moment. Uh, and you know, dull moments aren't good moments. Uh, universities aren't meant for dull moments. They're meant for all the, the mutually animating form of enlivenment. So if you have an art exhibit and a, a football game and a Supreme Court justice uh, and uh, uh, economic specialists all resonating with each other, then you have the kind of place that really does make the mind move. And I guess that that's what education is you could say, has Duke suffered no consequences? Has Duke not noticed that the world is actually in enduring distress outside its walls? Of course, uh, this, you know, no institution is immune to the turmoil of this times. And let's be clear, to the uncertainty of this times. Uh, we're making up our budgets now for next year and the year after, but the whole point is, no one knows what variables to put in for them. Uh, and so you have to plan within a much wider range of uh, speculative targets than you did before. Uh, well, we won't be we won't be opening as many new buildings in the next five years as we did in the last five years. I'm sure that's true. Uh, nevertheless, I would say, we are in an all-weather business. Higher education isn't something people, it's not like elective surgery, you know. Uh, people need higher education, whatever is gonna come, whatever is gonna happen next. Duke's other business is the medical business, and actually that's another business that has uh, held up because of the, of the fundamental and continuing needs of the human organism. So we are uh, in a strong line of work based on what we've done in the last few years, uh, after the financial aid initiative, if we have more students who need aid, we are now provide, we are now in a position to provide for that. So I think um, things we've done in recent years have strengthened us. But I would also just make the point that will be completely obvious to you if you stop and think about it, which is the, the, the rate at which universities advance is not directly proportional to the amount of resources they have available to them. It has some proportion, but not a total proportion. The way schools eventually advance has everything to do with the quality of intelligence with which they define their goals and the quality of focus with which they direct their goals and their effort and resources toward things that are most important. And let me be clear, that $300 million for financial aid did not come in the door by accident. It was decided that that was a strategic objective for the university and now we've reached it. Indeed, the building of the National Museum, it's not like it grew. You know, you could have waited and waited for that field of vegetation to turn into a museum, uh, but it wouldn't have happened. It was decided that that was a strategic need of the university to get stronger in that area, and so it was created. Uh, and I'd like to think that even if we're now gonna go through some lean years to follow some fat years, uh, it, the burden will always be put up on us to try to have smarter ideas and better guesses about what it's gonna be important for a university to be in the future. Uh, let me just say, and if I, you've heard me say this before, then I uh, will apologize, uh, though I always found repetition an essential teaching tool. <laughs> We have to believe that in the future, people are going to want slightly different things from higher education than have been, uh, than have been what has been provided over the last 50 or 60 years. Uh, you know that most universities are built on a model of specialization where after a while you stop learning about lots of things and you come to know more and more about a small number of things. Uh, and that has been a, a valuable and powerful tool but we also know that we live in a world in which all the most serious problems, none of them can be solved through a single discipline. All of them require people working at the same problem from many angles and with many different forms of knowledge and many different sets of skill. 
Uh, we've tried to make this uh, interdisciplinarity, it just sounds like a, an academic buzzword, but what we're really trying is to create a university in which people learn how to move in a mobile way to assemble multiple sets of skills when that's what you need to solve a problem. And I'll just tell you, this fall I went to uh, India on Duke's behalf. India is a place with great engineers and great engineering training. The world, uh, everybody in the world knows about the Indian Institutes of Management. Uh, but when I went there and talked about our Master of Engineering Management program and said that it in involved simultaneous training in engineering and in business courses where you learn how to build a business plan uh, to, to see whether an invention can be made commercially viable, and courses in the law school on intellectual property, since actually you have to understand that before you can advance, uh, you could see that there, the, the air of admiration and envy in this room was intense. That the, the people were, kind of, were learning the different sides of the problem. They were learning how to put different pieces of the puzzle together. Uh, uh, and that's very different from the model in most places in the world, where you learn a single thing and hope somebody else knows something about something else. Uh, uh, Texas is a great state of, uh, for energy. Uh, uh, we have new programs in energy, but the way we've created our energy programs has them located simultaneously in our engineering school, because that's where new technology will come from, and our environment school, because we need to understand the economics and uh, 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 public consequences of engineering choices, and our public policy school, the Sanford Institute, because of course it's really going to be the policy landscape that affects the way any new technology helps us or fails to help us. So the first thing we'd say is we're trying to create a new model of education in which the disciplines come together and people learn how to bring them together. Second, we're looking to create a model of education uh, which isn't just about being good in class, but learning how to connect the things you learn in class to real problems in the world, and those problems to be located perhaps one block from your university or 20,000 miles from your university. We want our faculty and our students to be able to be active contributors to problem solving on, uh, across the array that extends around the globe, but starting at home. And again, I could choose a million examples. Uh, when I went to India, uh, it, it, uh, I knew some things I would find there. I knew that our global health program was being consulted about building a new set of public health institutes over there. I knew that Duke researchers were uh, active studying AIDS and the cultural issues that cause its transmission or help uh, to spread its, tra uh, its transmission. But I did not realize that people in India would be aware of colleagues from our environment school who had helped devise the ecosystem protection rules that govern the Indian Ocean, or that they're trying to get to govern the Indian Ocean. Uh, that's a good thing when your university can collaborate with people around the world, use their talent and your talent to solve the problems of our time. I think the third thing I'd say, and this is, this is point three of three, in case you are uh, again getting weary in advance, uh, is we're looking to a model ed of education that won't be based on some people telling other people something and then testing them to see if they learned it. Uh, we are looking to a model of education in which we're going to ask students to be active participants, to invite them into the world and have them make their own ingenuity, their own creativity, their own concern, a fundamental ingredient, uh, so that they can learn to be, active, as I say, active contributors when they go out from Duke. If you come to campus, I would love to show you the Nasher, but I would take almost as much pleasure to take you to the obscure and funky building called the Smart Home. Do some of you know it? Okay, the Smart Home is a building, a group of students in engineering said, we'd like to build a house in which we would devise, you know, the, what they said to me is, there's way better ways to solve uh, uh, energy problems, water use problems, than any that are commercially available. We'd like to build a house where we could devise all the systems, right, where we could use our intelligence to create the world around us. I went to this house, I saw the, sh you know, I, they're the only students who shower I ever inspected because they wanted me to see 
how they capture the hot water going out of the shower and use it to reheat the water so you don't have to use more energy uh, to, to, to use it over again. To me, the interesting thing of that, the kids who live in that house are really smart. And they are going to be, you're going to hear their names. I can tell you some names today if you write them down, and I will win to that. These are people who are really going to be major contributors to uh, the issues of our time. But the fun thing is, they went to a college that didn't just give them high grades, but that gave them a sheet, a, 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 a blank slate, and said, you, you think you could make something? Let's see you make it. And let's have you create it so that your successors can make the better thing when they come along and become their residents in turn. Or I'll just mention one other example, because this was almost defies belief. A group of uh, recruited athletes at Duke formed an educational mission to Vietnam, where last summer they educated between 80 and 90 students. One of these students had worked in Vietnam one summer. She was on the varsity tennis team. She got a group of students from football, from track, from all kinds of things. A bunch of them went over. They taught English. They taught physics. They taught math and they taught badminton, and they taught soccer, and they taught basketball, and they taught two other sports that are not occurring to me at this moment that are played in equally small areas. So I said to this person, Parker Goyer, who created this thing, how did you have the facilities to play these sports on? And she said, well, we built them before the program started. And I said, well, where did you get the means to build them? And she looked at me like I was quite a dull fellow. She said, well, looking on a website one day, we noticed that the State Department had grants for this kind of things for public diplomacy. And so we applied for one and won the grant. And with that money, they went and built this sports facility, next to which they built an education facility. And then students would shuttle back and forth between learning English and physics and sports as the day went on. And when they came back, what was so interesting was to me, they went to a country where, like many countries in the world, the educational system is very academic and very memory oriented. But they had created an academic system. They learned something about their own education. They learned that it's the interplay of so-called fun and so-called study that really makes for education in the uh, great universities of this country. And what I found especially touching was, uh, Parker Goyer said, uh, said to me, you know, we, we reflected, uh, we came to realize that all these things we learned in uh, sports practice turned out to be highly valuable as educational tools when we were there. We'd taken leadership training, we learned about team building, and we taught people how to do these things, uh, and it was all new to them. Uh, so our students learned about a culture, they offered something to that culture, and they learned something about themselves, and they learned something about the meaning of their own education. Now we've created this program, I trust you know about it, called Duke Engage, in which we have offered uh, to students the, uh, the, the, the challenge, find some place and we'll help you, find some place where there's a problem in the world that you can use your education to help contribute to the solution of, and we will help to send you there. We had 90 students uh, from Uganda and Peru to Durham and New Orleans uh, the first summer. Last summer we had 360. And here's a fact you may or may not know. This year, Duke had 3,600 more applicants for its undergraduate school than we did last year. And you want to know something? Maybe that's all because of the recession. But I can't help believing that it has something to do with people understanding that this is a school that's serious about education and quite imaginative about what education is going to turn out to be, uh, what form it's going to take in the future, and it's trying to get them now. I will stop my wake will be calm remarks at this point and turn to phase two. I'm now going to summon on stage, and maybe he would come in. Oh, I didn't mention to you, this is a kind of simulation. This is a, this is a sculpture gallery. One of these sculptures is my, a replica of my office. <laughs> kind of. Uh, that's why it's the only leaded windows in the uh, Nasher Garden, uh, uh, and uh, why you can see the West Campus mysteriously appearing on the horizon. <laughs> if you will come and sit yourself there, I'll tell people who you are. Uh, this is Sandy Williams, our Dr. R. Sanders Williams. Uh, I would introduce you. I would introduce him first by saying I am uh, uh, honored to call him one of my very good friends. 
uh, a person whose uh, the breadth and depth of whose knowledge is extraordinary. Uh, he is a demon hiker. Uh, he canoed for th th 400 miles of wilderness in Alaska this summer. Uh, and at night, instead of res resting, he read Anna Karenina. And when I first came as president, he was the only person thoughtful enough to find a Faulkner quotation to greet me with. Uh, but, uh, although he is not uh, uh, med near medical in the narrow sense, there is no denying that he is medical in the profound sense. Uh, and he really has been Mr. Medicine in some significant way at Duke. You went to college at Princeton, you came and did your medical uh, training at Duke, you went and did a residence at Mass General and then came back and were on the faculty for X, like 15, 12, something like that years. He was mature by the time, by this point. Uh, then, uh, then, as you may know, Sandy came to Dallas where he was the chief of cardiology at UT Southwestern. Uh, and then Duke had the good fortune to attract him back in the role of dean of the medical school, where he was really the leader of medical education and faculty building at Duke at a time when all kinds of things, when, when the meaning of genomics first became clear to us, when the reach, the potential global reach of medicine came clear to us. You were the person who really oversaw the building of a medical school in Singapore that is one of our major international extensions. Uh, and after you stepped down as dean, which was about a year and a half ago, uh, into the role of uh, senior vice chancellor for medicine at Duke, uh, we, uh, the provost and I have then asked Sandy to become our high level strategist for the international ventures of the university. Uh, so this is a person who really sort of exemplifies the kind of model of education and has been a leader in helping to create it. And now, by artful transition, I will make my way to my chair. <laughs> to your office. Uh, Sandy can tell you that my office doesn't exact, it doesn't look identical to this, uh, but it does have a big window and it has these two chairs. And you and I have sat in these chairs and talked many times. Uh, so long, podium. <laughs> that was a very nice introduction, Dick. But the nicest thing you said about me, you said earlier, and you said I was a standard Duke issue person. So I, I take that as the highest praise indeed. Well, why do you think I led with it? <laughs> Let me just, I, I just want to ask you some questions uh, just to warm you up, and then as I say, we'll throw ourselves open to people in this room. Uh, you know, you're a person who went to college at a certain point, and maybe you had some vague idea what you might do, uh, but at a certain point, you zeroed in on cardiology and the work you did there. Just, I would just be interested to have you tell a little the sort of your intellectual biography. How did something become that interesting to you? How did you find the thing that hooked you? Um, I'm asked this question often by medical students uh, who turn to me for their own career counseling and, and undergraduate students too. And what I can tell them quite honestly is I was just as loved as they are. Um, and my career path, the wonderful as it's been, was entirely unpredictable. In fact, I would never advise anyone to try to follow it because the, the, the curves and twists along the way were, um, I don't think, could be replicated, a, a lot of luck involved, but uh, I, I, I did uh, have the advantage of being in places that, where the, the education was superb and all of the dimensions of the university that you described Duke today uh, prepared me for all of these unpredictable, um, the unpredictable route that I took. Uh, my undergraduate degree was actually in, in public and international affairs. Uh, I went to college uh, with grandiose ideas that I would be a diplomat uh, <coughs> of a Henry Kissinger type, that I would promote world peace by my ability to persuade warring parties to, uh, uh, to get along. It's not too late. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> university administrators learned to do some of that. But, uh, the, uh, uh, but the events of the time, uh, which included uh, our engagement in, in Vietnam, were, were not of a sort that inspired idealistic young people in the government service. And uh, I'd always been interested in science, and I had an epiphany of sorts my, my junior year after I'd already committed to a major when taking a biology course of, uh, just out of interest, 
uh, a wonderful professor uh, told me about slime molds. Slime, slime molds are these wonderful organisms that uh, have these fantastic properties, and, and I was uh, in, in rapture. This also was, <laughs> what, 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 what made it so interesting is this was the dawn of the era of molecular biology. The genetic code uh, had been described in Marshall Nirenberg's lab only two years before. So the DNA makes RNA makes protein was just known and we could begin to see the rudiments of how this actually worked. And somehow then all the policy statements and policy conferences I was doing uh, seemed less exciting. And I said, this, this insight into the inner workings of biology is going to transform society. And I don't know what I want to do, but I want to be in that game. Uh, and, and I underwent a transformation. I prepared myself to go to medical school. Duke University was kind enough to accept me without even the minimum requirements because I had, had, had a very thin uh, smattering of science courses. But I guess I was persuasive uh, that I was a, a creative maverick, which is what we, we, we tend to look for in our medical school, and they took me. Uh, and then I continued to have steps of good fortune to fall under the influence of very fine physicians and scientists. And, um, what I like to tell people about my career, uh, medical students now, is I've really had three careers in my life. For the first 15 years, I was a doctor uh, and a scientist on the side. And then I became enamored of a particular scientific question, dove more deeply into it. And for the next 20 years, I was a scientist and a doctor on the side. Uh, and then, with my return to Duke in a senior leadership role, I'm, I'm now in a third phase of my career where the experiences I had before prepared me well, but what I really am now is a kind of academic executive and entrepreneur. Um, my job is not about caring for patients or doing science so much anymore as empowering others to do that in the new ways, many of which you alluded to in your introduction. Well, sure, and of course I love listening to this story because the whole point is, like, what kind of slime mold? Uh, the whole point is, it wasn't slime mold all by itself that altered your life. Uh, it was the fact that it's the thing they were looking at when one of the great discoveries was made, really, you know, as the, in the first half of the 20th century, the things that were learned about physics were really, that was probably the lead area of discovery in the world, and now the life sciences have taken that uh, role, I think, I think unarguably, uh, probably since the 1960s or so. And so you're saying that it was like something actually in the world of human discovery that made you want to put your life at that point. And, and the great discoveries in, in biomedical science uh, have been driven in large measure uh, by the study of these simple organisms, uh, the model organisms that they're called. We, we, we learn more about human cancers often by studying yeasts or worms. Uh, and that, that's, that's been a driver of modern biology. So what led you to the heart? Uh, my wife's in the audience, she may remember a time. Could you see if she's nodding yes or no? She, she may remember a time we went jogging around Jamaica Pond in Boston when I had to face a, uh, a big decision about what, what medical specialty I was going to enter. And I was trying to decide between the two. And she, finally she put her foot down and said, just decide, what is it? And so I said, it's going to be heart. And uh, what was the other one? Uh, the other one was endocrinology. Uh, I was fascinated by the way that hormones work. And, but uh, what, I, what I saw is at the time, people who studied heart were thought of as kind of plumbers. You stuck catheters in hearts, you, you gave electric shocks. But it wasn't where, there was no molecular biology in, 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 heart, in heart disease research. Uh, in fact, I, I was probably the, among the first three cardiologists in the world to actually measure RNA in cells. I learned how to do that before most everybody else did. But what I saw is uh, heart, the heart research had a wide open opportunity for people who would enter medicine and want to understand its fundamental workings at a molecular level. And there was more opportunity there than some of the other specialties. And that, that proved to be a, uh, a lucky choice.
Well, now I'm going to jump forward a little bit because then the day comes when you not only were good at what you did, you know, and this is a nationally and internationally recognized researcher uh, in this domain, but then you were good at helping other people do things, and then you became a dean. Uh, I'm just, I'm interested in having you reflect on the question of, you know, so you've been in charge of the training of people for the profession of medicine. Now, there was a time when that consisted in teaching people how to apply the leeches. Right. But in your own lifetime, although you are only recently mature, uh, uh, the discoveries, the intellectual discoveries you're talking about have really also changed the possibilities of the practice of medicine. Just talk, talk a little bit about how uh, the, your understanding of the training of future doctors has, has evolved. One of my heroes in medicine was a mar marvelously cultivated mind of a man named Lewis Thomas, who was an oncologist and became the head of the Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. For, for years he wrote a column in the New England Journal of Medicine called Notes of a Biology Watcher. So he was one of the physicians I most admired who brought this belief that medicine would advance best by those who understood the fundamental underlying biological principles. But he also wrote a book uh, that I, for years, used to give out to trainees in my lab. In fact, there's, there's some here. I may, I may have given you this book. He called medicine the youngest science. Um, and this is true. Uh, medicine was slow to uh, move out of the realm of witchcraft or authority. Um, in fact, it's, uh, it, 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 I believe I have this fact right, the faculty of Harvard College voted rather late in the 19th century to um, abolish the medical school at Harvard because they thought it was a, uh, oh, a, a shameful uh, blot on the reputation of the university. Uh, this is true. Medicine came, came to science late. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, there still is a lot of pseudoscience and uh, dogmatism, uh, people who speak with authority. If, if, if your doctor ever says, in my experience, get a new doctor. Uh, uh, not that experience isn't important, uh, particularly for surgeons and people who do, do procedures, but no single doctor's experience is ever adequate to take in the breadth and depth of complexity of the human organism. You really only can learn what's right in a medical decision uh, by analysis often of hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of patients, far beyond whatever one doctor can see. But this kind of thinking has come late into medicine. And I think uh, programs uh, of medical education that have geared themselves to demanding evidence, to demanding an understanding of the biological underpinnings uh, are the ones that produce the kinds of physicians that, that we're proud to produce at Duke, um, and now in other places around the world. Okay, so uh, now without offense to anybody from Southwestern who can cover their ears at this point, uh, you have had this uh, uh, long affiliation with Duke Medicine, right? And I heard you introduced as the Senior Vice Chancellor of Duke Medicine. Is there such a thing as Duke Medicine? Um, your quasi-military uh, introduction of me as a regular issue Duke person, uh, there is a, an analogy in the culture of Duke Medical Center that was clearly there long before I came, called the Duke Marine. Uh, Duke doctors pride themselves, and there are several in the audience, uh, some of whom now, now work here in Dallas. Uh, but uh, <coughs> the meaning of a Duke Marine as a Duke doctor meant that you never abandon your duty to your patient. That whatever it took to do right by your patient, you did, and nothing got in the way of that. You never abandoned your post. Uh, that was the ethos that was built into Duke Medical Center. Um, and then the, the other part of the ethos that, that made it very special for me, and, and I hope I've been able to continue this in the, in the recent generations that have come, is that, uh, Medical education at Duke takes it as a, uh, oh, a, a given that our graduates will be, be capable physicians. Uh, the education that we give them assures that they will do that. And 
and they are tested rigorously to ensure that that's the case. But our, our, our motto is that that's not enough. You must be a capable physician, but you also must be a leader and scholar of medicine. We, we demand of our, our students and we expect of our graduates that when, when they leave the medical school, they'll go on to make their mark somewhere in medicine. Um, there's a great diversity of ways that they do that, some by medical research, some by becoming uh, noted clinicians, some by becoming presidents of biotechnology companies, or by working in public health uh, sites in, in the developing world. Great diversity of outcomes, but uh, being a lifetime scholar and, and, and demanding that they prepare themselves for leadership has been part of our, our, our motto for a long time. Well, I could think of plenty of examples of it. Um, I'm interested, I, uh, everybody of course knows that health care is on the great long agenda of very difficult questions faced in this country. And I'm not going to ask you how to solve the problems of the economics of health care, uh, which have their own complexity. But how do you see health care itself evolving in the next generation? It's already so different, you know. When I was a kid and you were sick, you stayed home from school, which was so delightful, and your mom would call the doctor, and sometime during the day the doctor would show up. I can't remember the last time the doctor came to, well, you came to my house, but not if you were doctor. Uh, what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you see for the, for the next day? Uh, I've made house calls on uh, several notable people that do on occasion. Uh, my wife will remember that. Um, <coughs> I think some of the trends that will affect medicine in the future are evident to us today. Uh, the basic paradigm of the encounter between a uh, patient and a physician um, that grew up over the centuries focused on acute illnesses. You get sick, you go to your doctor, they make some recommendation, uh, you either get well or you don't. Uh, for most of history, having very little to do with what, what the doctor did or not. Uh, today we do a little better than that. But that model of dealing with acute illness is now uh, only the smallest part of what doctors do. Most of the encounters between physicians and patients, or between patients and non-physician uh, healthcare providers who increasingly are an important part of medical teams, is not around some acute condition that will either kill the patient or from which they'll recover, but chronic diseases like uh, like heart disease, uh, diabetes, cancer, neurodegenerative diseases. These are the scourges of, of modern times, and our, uh, our, our medical systems need to adapt to, to this kind of environment. Uh, the other uh, aspect of the future of medicine that we, as you know, we, we believe in very much at Duke because many of our programs are designed to help drive this faster, is the notion that, that one size does not fit all. We are all different. We all have uh, different genetic makeup, we have different life experiences, uh, the decisions we make in our lives are all different. And the, the idea that, that a diagnosis like breast cancer is a single disease is just not true. It is a quite different disease, um, certainly within its many different diseases and, and in some sense almost unique to each, each individual. Um, Well-known uh, spokespeople in the pharmaceutical industry comment, Dick, that um, even very effective drugs only work well in about a third of the people who take them. Uh, but the problem is we don't know which third, so there's a lot of trial and error. Uh, there's risk because some people will respond badly. It, we, we're still practicing one-size-fits-all medicine uh, far beyond what would be ideal, and so the concept of personalized medicine has arisen. Uh, that is here now in some sectors, uh, and I think this is what will begin to dominate. Uh, you, uh, I think you advised me not to get into healthcare economics. Uh, oh, so you can. <laughs> Uh, well, I, 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 that would be too big a topic for the time we want to uh, devote to it tonight, but uh, I think many of you would likely agree with me that our medical system in the United States is badly broken. Uh, it is unjust, it is inefficient, uh, it, it is wasteful, uh, and it is not consistent with the human dignity that we, we'd like to uh, think that we in the medical profession can offer. 
Um, there is no simple fix to it. Uh, I hope our new president's team can take this on, but it can't be taken on in one piece or another. Uh, it's going to have to be taken on with a wholesale uh, and rather radical uh, change in, in how we deliver care. The principle, the correct principles, I think, are providing some level of care to all. Uh, a great country ought to do that. Um, making sure that the care, uh, that the, whatever dollars we feel as a society we can afford to put in the healthcare system, uh, deliver uh, a good return. Uh, the waste in the current system is tremendous for a variety of reasons that I could enumerate, but I won't. Um, and so uh, there is a way to do it better. Uh, our new president is surrounding himself with some of the best minds. Uh, and we all heard in his uh, inauguration speech uh, the word science appeared quite prominently. So uh, I'm hopeful and I hope, uh, I hope uh, other Dukies will join me in that hope. Uh, but something different needs to be done or all the best training of, of doctors will uh, not produce the result we want for our country or the world. Given your current role, there's one more thing I want to ask you, and then I realize I'm being quite selfish here, uh, but if you don't stop me, I'll just keep asking you questions all night, uh, which, is, which is this. You became dean of a famous American medical school, but during your deanship, that school partnered in Singapore to create what is already becoming a famous Asian medical school. Why was that a good thing for a medical school to do? Um, this is a wonderful story uh, where uh, when I first became Dean at Duke, uh, I was learning a new job that was quite demanding and, and uh, one of my assistants came in and said, next week there's some people from Singapore coming, do you want to meet with them? And I said, no, I'm too busy, let, let someone else do it. Uh, but this assistant who was uh, perceptive said, I've met one of these people and you should meet them. And, and I did. And, to make a long story short, that began a relationship that has now blossomed into a venture that uh, many regard as best in class of uh, uh, a partnership between a major U.S. university and, and an overseas partner in, in, in an educational venture. Um, the Singapore government had decided they wanted for the benefit of their own society, a different kind of medical school. They have a very fine medical school that's actually older than Duke and educate very fine physicians in the British tradition where students go directly from high school into medicine. But they felt that the physicians they were producing, though capable physicians, were not uh, moving into these realms of leadership and entrepreneurism that their society needed. And when they looked around the world to find the model for what they wanted, they ended on our doorstep. And uh, at first, I thought this was a, a crazy idea. How, how could we maintain uh, supply lines to a place on the, it's almost on the exact opposite side of the planet. Uh, how could we do this? But then when I met the people, saw their resolve, uh, and began to think of the possibilities of this, I was converted from a skeptic to an apostle. And I have been uh, the driver of this project, it's diluted. So now we have a medical school in Singapore, the financial support to the tune of in excess of a half a billion dollars investment by the Singapore government has made this real. We have faculty, we have students, and uh, there's a metaphor I like to use, I'm going to plagiarize the provost briefly. Uh, that the mission of a university like Duke for a while with respect to people around the world was to act as a magnet. Uh, Duke was a magnet for all of us who studied there. We went there and we gained from it and went out in the world, and that's what Duke did. Um, there's another metaphor that now it's time for a great university to shine what it does out to other places in the world. This is the beacon metaphor. But I'd actually take it a step further than the provost did. Uh, and I'm going to use a word that you used in your introduction, resonating. I think what, we're, what we've created in Singapore is a resonating system. There's a source of light at Duke that shines to Singapore, but now it has developed its own source of energy and light that is shining back to Durham and making what we do in the medical school there better. Um, and I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll say briefly what I mean by that. Um, Medical education, uh, and the doctors in the room will know this, 
for years relied heavily on memorization. Uh, you would spend, uh, medical students have told me they spend maybe 30, 40% of their time just memorizing things to take the test. That is a waste of a good brain, particularly in the modern era where no brain can contain all the information you need. What you need to have is an intellectual structure and the ability to access the knowledge you need at the time that you need it. What we were able to do in Singapore is set up the new educational program there, though it mirrors the Duke curriculum entirely, to largely do away with memorization. And we've done that through a concept called team-based learning, where the students uh, are given a problem to solve, much like the, the, the smart house. We're doing that in medicine. We give them a problem to solve, and we don't ask them to recite the, the names of the cranial nerves or, or the bones in the hand. Uh, if it's necessary to know that to solve the problem, they will come upon that information and they will figure out how to use it. And the remarkable thing about this is they're performing better on standardized tests, uh, at least in some ways, despite the fact we haven't at all prepared them for the test in the traditional way. This learning environment is actually working. So as our people in charge of medical education do see some of the dynamics that are happening in Singapore, we're beginning to adjust some of our own system. Turning an institution like Duke is like turning a battleship. You know, you've got many, many people who are vested in the way things have always been done. We like to be nimble, but it's not easy. The beauty of the Singapore Medical School is it's been like a, like a startup. It's been entrepreneurial, we could try out new ideas. So this, I think, is the model for globalization, a resonating system uh, shining <coughs> back and forth. And it's my ambition, and uh, Dick, I know you share this too, that there will be many such resonating systems anchored at Duke um, within a few years. Well, just to say, uh, and maybe it's already completely obvious from what you just said, which is it's partly a matter of sharing forms of knowledge that we have and sharing forms of training that we're good at giving uh, to places that can then give those themselves. Uh, but your point is that through partnerships like this, we actually can experiment with the nature of education itself. Uh, when you talk about memorization, everyone in the room knows the truth of this statement, which is the human mind remembers everything it finds important to remember at the time it finds it important to remember it. Uh, why is what, memorization is the word we use for that artificial effort to remember things when there's really nothing that makes you want to remember it at that point. <laughs> um, so now you're talking about giving people um, reasons to remember, you might say. That's to say, rather than simply making memory as if it were the goal. Uh, that's a pretty profound uh, a, a transformation in the nature of uh, uh, of education, and we can uh, do that experiment somewhere else, and then we, we ourselves can benefit from it going forward. Uh, as I say, I will I will be selfish no longer, uh, but uh, throw this open, and please uh, let's have you guys ask Sandy some questions or ask me some questions about medicine, about healthcare, about Duke, about uh, whatever it is uh, we could we could speak to, sir. How do you reconcile the amount of money it costs to send a kid to medical school in this country? with the cost it takes to bring a foreign trained physician over here. How do you think this is going to play out over the next 10 or 15 years as we're seeing fewer people going into primary care that are <coughs> born, but increasing numbers of third world trained physicians coming into the primary care areas of specialization? Um, I can tell you what I'd like to see. I'd like to see us moving towards a world where there are global standards for medical education and where um, physicians trained in other countries are trained to the same standards that we would think should apply to U.S. physicians and that they have opportunities to practice medicine in their own countries. And we're not the only place where people can feel they have a dignified life as, as physicians. We need to work towards that. My, my personal view is that medicine is going to uh, increasingly uh, be driven by encounters between patients and people who are not physicians, healthcare teams that are guided by physicians, but where a lot of what happens now uh, will be done by people who have different types of training. You'll always need physicians in the system, and certain things will always be done by people trained like, like us, but I think the, to, to take the current uh, model 
and expand it indefinitely is not financially sustainable. We've got to have a different model. Uh, we are using our own health system at Duke to experiment with new models of healthcare, with new roles for nurse clinicians. Uh, Duke invented the physician assistant program, uh, which is uh, was a quite quite remarkable innovation. Uh, it still hasn't penetrated much of the global medicine. So. Um, we, have, we want Duke to be a place of innovation and at least to contribute to some of the solutions. <coughs> Please. Um, I'm a 1996 graduate of medical school and um, now a pediatrician. And I'm curious because you talked about shifts from acute care of sickness to care of chronic disease, but you didn't really mention anything about the role that physicians play in prevention. And I'm wondering what Duke is doing in that area, because I think in pediatrics, we think we do a lot of prevention, but don't necessarily have the evidence to support it, because the research hasn't necessarily been done. Well, th thank you for, uh, I, I really am grateful for that question, because it realized I uh, didn't communicate the full scope of what I meant by personalized medicine. The ultimate application of personalized medicine would be personalized prevention, uh, where our, our, our genetic makeup is known, our propensity to develop disease is identified in childhood if possible, and appropriate preventive measures are applied. Nothing at all like that happens today. Uh, the, uh, even the preventive measures that we know are effective are not applied uniformly because the economic models of medicine disincent this people from doing it. Uh, it becomes a charitable act to practice good medicine and not sustainable unless you have some other source of income. That must change. Um, it, 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 it's an interesting but shameful statistic that for many of the major diseases, you're better off living in Cuba than in parts of the U.S. Because in Cuba, they don't do anything but prevention. All of their medical resources go to prevention. And, and they get a good result for that. Now, if you get acute leukemia in Cuba, you better get to Miami or you're going to die. <laughs> but if you, but if, if you want your child to be vaccinated, uh, you, you have a better probability of that happening in Cuba than you do in Miami. So uh, our system needs to learn. I, and I, I will say, uh, Duke, I believe, has been in the forefront of U.S. Uh, medical systems and schools in, in applying prevention. Uh, one of my earlier uh, roles was to be uh, uh, an assistant to Andy Wallace, who created Duke's preventive approach to cardiology. We went out in the community to do this. So I've been in that game personally for a long time, and I believe it very much. So thank you for your, your question. And, and I would just add, you know, Duke has between 30 and 40,000 employees. We used to be the third largest private employer in North Carolina, and now with the disappearance of Wachovia, we are the second. Uh, and Duke has actually been working with its own workforce uh, to try to create a model of prospective and preventive medicine, uh, and then to demonstrate the results so that we could then use it as a model that other employers would have an incentive to adopt. Yeah, every Duke employee uh, can get a health coach, can receive uh, gratis uh, screening for LDL, uh, cholesterol, and so forth, and, uh, and then uh, there's a reward system if they achieve certain uh, <coughs> goals with their blood pressure and, and, and weight, uh, they, they can earn rewards. So we, we're trying to practice what we preach with our own employees. And to create what we hope will be a contagious, in the good sense, example. <laughs> But uh, two questions actually. One um, regarding you know partnership, really. What do you think the role of telemedicine is in terms of delivery of healthcare to the rural areas of the U.S. and resulting in standardization of healthcare and efficiencies gained from that? And second question is really, where do you think we're going in terms of standardizing our technology in terms of EMR and the other things that would actually result in collecting data and to see where our inefficiencies are. Yeah. Uh, telemedicine is uh, an interesting concept. I, I'm rather surprised it hasn't penetrated more into medicine than it has because the technology is there. Um, the 
reimbursement mechanisms have lagged, and that I think has, has limited its penetration. But uh, it, I think we need to use our technologies much more wisely to lower the cost of healthcare and produce better outcomes, and telemedicine should play a role in that. Uh, and the second part of your question was, yeah. oh, it, yeah, electronic medical record. Um, it is shameful, uh, and many of you have probably had this experience. Uh, you, 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 you go see your internist, and you, you sit and fill out forms, and then you go see your cardiologist who's in the next office, and you fill out the same forms, and the, the records don't connect. Um, that, that, uh, that, that's that been true across American medicine, and still is true in many settings. Um, it, it, there, there would be, I think, some meaningful uh, efficiencies and better patient care that would come if we could adopt a national system of medical records. The, the, the security concerns can now be dealt with. Uh, it's time to do that, and that is a platform of President Obama's uh, health care reform program, one of his prominent platforms. It won't solve all the problems, but it, it clearly should be done and, and could improve care and efficiency. We're doing that at Duke, by the way. Uh, we have we, we have uh, a fully uh, integrated system in our hospitals, and we now have uh, kiosks in our clinics, like like at the airport. You can show up and swipe your card, and the doctor knows everything about you. You don't have to fill out all the forms again, and, and you can go anywhere in our system, and your records follow you. But you can't go. You couldn't go to Johns Hopkins yet and have the Duke records follow you. We aren't, we aren't at that stage. Not that generous. <laughs> <laughs> here's a question here and here's a question here. Um, just a follow-up um, about the, um, the Obama plan to try and uh, create a national system of electronic records. I've just been wondering, as I've heard Obama talk about that, as to what organization would actually be responsible for setting the standards for such a system. I think you'd have lots of uh, organizations that have already tried to uh, implement technology for hospitals, and there'd be a lot of competing standards and that and sort of thing. I'm just curious as to, as to what you think would be the best way to try and approach that, you know, to come up with a workable system that everyone would buy into. Um, well, I don't want to give a glib answer, but uh Federal policy around Medicare sets the tone for everything else in the medical system. What Medicare pays for will drive the behaviors of the providers. And if uh, that becomes a requirement for a certain uh, nosology and, and record keeping and so forth is built into that, uh, everybody will respond. Sir? Um, I recall reading in April uh, the results of a poll wherein for the first time in history a majority of the United States physicians advocated a single health care system. And do you have any thoughts on the significance of that? Um, it probably reflects frustration among the physician community in the current system, uh, which I think is a frustration shared by patients and, and the general community. Uh, Nobody likes our system. Uh, if, if, if you're well connected and, and well insured, you can generally find your way to, to, to good care. But even then, it's not easy. Uh, another one of my heroes in medicine is David Lawrence, who, who ran the Kaiser Permanente program for years. He wrote a wonderful story where he describes this, uh, describes a wonderfully old, witty, elderly woman who has a series of medical problems, and he, 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 in the story he walks through her saga of trying to deal with her 14 different doctors. This is familiar to many of you who have older parents. Or, uh, and he goes through, she's smart, she's well insured, but she has a devil of a time, just getting her basic medical needs in. And then at the end of the story he says it's his mother. Uh, so here's a guy who is as well connected as anyone could be, and even he can't make the system work. Uh, that's, that's what we have. So uh, we can do better. The, the great medical centers like Duke and, and, and here at UT Southwestern do their very best to streamline the systems. And it's never, uh, the problems of American medicine are not the problems of any individual goodwill or, or good intent. Uh, it is that the system is, defeats goodwill and good intent too often. Uh, we can change this. I'll, I'll, I see two more, and then I think we've got to take a, take a break. Please. You're talking about 
We talked about the U.S. health care system and compared that to the Cuban health care system. Is there an industrial country whose health care system works? Um, well, again, uh, I, I see a lot to admire about Singapore's system. Uh, they, they have a public system that provides a safety net to every citizen. No woman in Singapore goes without prenatal care. Schizophrenics are in hospitals and not sleeping under bridges. Uh, it, 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 it's just. They have a justice. They also have a private system where if you want a nicer room and fancier food, you can pay more and get that. Uh, and it, it works pretty well. They have medical savings accounts uh, that uh, put consumer pressures and consumer forces, uh, market forces into medical <coughs> choices. And, but they demand very high standards. So I don't know that, that it's the answer, but I think there's some uh, principles that where they've shown the value of it. That's another good thing about us. We can go to Singapore test out a new model of health care there with the willing participation of their, their government. And if we show the value, we can try to bring it back and, and, and put it in place in Durham. We, we're doing something. Yes, you, you mentioned the frustrations, uh, and they're well documented, and I think largely understood. Have you seen that that has discouraged at all, the, the number and quality of young students that are willing to go into the medical profession? Thank God, no. <laughs> if ever I get depressed about the American health care system, I just go talk to medical students. And, I, and, my, and my faith is restored. Uh, we, we, we get amazing kids that come in, and they just make you, uh, they are not at all cynical or um, uh, pessimistic about their own futures in medicine. They're wary. And they are uh, concerned about what the future will hold for them, but uh, they're wonderful. Uh, come visit and you, when you're depressed about health care. Uh, that's right, that's right. You know, we have so many hands here, uh, and the trouble is, well, I'll, I'll, I think what I better do is to say that Sa Sandy will stand up here and people can come up and ask him as many questions as they like. Uh, but let me uh, at this point say that uh, the drink will continue, the food will continue, the conversation will continue. But I just want to tell one story to end. Uh, you know, I am the ninth president of Duke. And the first president of Duke was the person named William Preston Few. He had been the president of Trinity College for many years and when sick, uh, he had a vision of how he could turn Trinity College into a great world university. Uh, he wrote up this document as if he were Mr. Duke writing the document. I have the document framed in the wall of my office. Uh, and it has this, which is for X dollars in cash or good securities, uh, I could turn Trinity College into X university, put in your name if you like. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it would have, and it listed the schools, it would have a business school, a law school, all these things. Uh, and that was going to take, what was it, 20 million dollars of 1924 dollars. That's a lot of money. <laughs> Uh, but then he came back to Mr. Duke after Mr. Duke indicated his acceptance and said, and for a few dollars more, we could have a medical school as well. Right? Uh, and that was, I believe, the last philanthropy, or almost the last decision of James P. Duke, was that to be the kind of university he had in mind, Duke had to be an undergraduate college, it had to have an array of professional schools, but then it had to have a medical school. Uh, and if you go back and read the life of James P. Duke, he's a person with a fourth grade education who became one of the world's most successful business people in more than one business in his life. Uh, but the founding of the university, the founding of the Duke Endowment, and all his philanthropies were based on the idea that knowledge can be of service. Uh, that there are things that mere service can solve that you need knowledge to solve, but knowledge needs to want to be of service before it can be of service. And he saw medicine as uh, at the core of, but not the limit of that, uh, of, of that intention. Sandy, you give a great example of it, and I thank you, and I thank you all for your time. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.